tries. Two points to clear up from uh, this morning, please, if I can. The first one on CCTV. Um, my instructions are that there is CCTV in what one calls operational areas to ensure the integrity of the service that's being provided, but not in canteens. Uh, and uh, perhaps I should have realised that that's something that the union would probably find objectionable. Yes. Uh, if its members were being filmed on their break, so not in canteen, so uh, uh, kept for 28 days. The second point was um, there was a point on the evidence this morning as to the proportions of uh, voters who were in delivery offices versus mail centres and distribution centres, and the delivery office workers would have been the ones who had access to uh, the frames, and yes. obviously substantial numbers will have worked uh, in delivery offices that serve their home address, and the figure that I have on instructions is in the region of 85,000 of the roughly 110,000. That leaves uh, 25,000 working in bigger distribution units, where, which will be um, less susceptible to what went on in this case. Um, well, I'm going to divide my submissions into four parts. The first part I want to spend, if I can, looking at some of the evidence in this case, which we haven't looked at very much in the course of Mr. Hendy's submissions. Secondly, I'm going to look at the judgment, bearing in mind the test was identified by uh, your Lordship as to the limits of the review in this case. Thirdly, I will look, on, look at my submissions in response to what Mr. Hendy has submitted. And fourthly, I'll spend a little bit of time at the end dealing with the matters raised in the respondents' notice, where you see we've, we've sought to affirm the judgment on some, some other grounds. Yes. Um, dealing with the first of those submissions, which is looking at the evidence, uh, I'm going to divide my submissions in relation to this part into three sections. Uh, the first part will be to identify the evidence which establishes the plan which the union uh, put into place. The second part will is, look... Is there really any dispute about that? I mean, well, there's a dispute about whether you call it a plan or encouragement or instructions, but um, other than those sorts of points, it seems to be well, I, accepted gonna, now. I appreciate it may not have been when you first started these proceedings. Well, it, it, <laughs> uh, a point very well put, if I might say, my lord, because uh, it is accepted now, but of course it's not accepted in any of the statements put in by the national officers on behalf of the trade union. Um, and uh, I, I do think it's important just to revisit the extent of that because it, it touches on uh, a, an important part of Mr. Hendy's submission, which is to say, well, this was, as it were, mere encouragement and everything is fine. When one looks at what actually was being expected of the trade union members from their leaders, uh, I say that that submission is very difficult to sustain. Um, so whilst there is a concession from Mr. Hendy, it's a limited concession, it's a concession that goes no further than to suggest, well, there was encouragement to sort of, come on, lads, uh, let's do this. Whereas when one actually looks at the evidence, it was much more prescriptive, and we say it set up a continuum which involved, at the beginning of that process, the interception of ballot papers as they came into the office, and ended that continuum with demonstrating you had complied with the union's exhortations by allowing yourself to be filmed in the course of posting the ballot. So I, I would respectfully suggest that Mr. Hendy's, submission, Mr. Hendy's concession doesn't actually go as far as the evidence demonstrates. So I'll spend a little bit of time on that. Yes, right. Then look very briefly at how the plan was uh, executed and then look finally in this three-part plan um, at the union's endorsement of what was being done, because they are quite distinct stages that one can recognise from the material that was before Mr Justice Swift. Dealing firstly with the um, plan itself, uh, my starting point is the exhibit to Mr McCauley's first witness statement, which is in the supplementary bundle. And, um, your 
watch it, we'll have it behind tab 3. <coughs> and um, with a bit of luck paginated in the same way that my bundle is, so that on the first page you have the um, notice of ballot 17th of September 2019, so just to make sure that we're all literally on the same page as well as potentially metaphorically. Um, but the first document... I'm not sure I am, I'm afraid. I'm uh, sorry? What a, the tab witness statement I have is at two. Yes, I'm, it's the exhibit I'm interested in. Uh, tab, tab oh, three. Right. <coughs> Letter from T. Kearns to S. Ashford, read notice to strike, is that Yes, it? so that, that, that is not um, of, of interest to me at, at the moment. Uh, what I'd like to take Lordships to right. is page 52 which is uh, a posting by Mr. Webb, who's Head of Communications at the CWU. <coughs> um, and the passages I'm interested in are at the beginning and end of this um, document, which is put on his Facebook uh, account. Um, and you can see he says, last week we discovered Royal Mail's seesaw communications. This is nothing but a sinister move to attempt to reduce the turnout. They know they've lost the battle on the yes vote. This is about trying to reduce the debate, interest and interaction with the ballot so people don't vote. In short, it won't work. We've got a detailed plan this week and we'll go for it like never before next week. And <clears throat> it's perhaps a point worth making in the context of the exchange that I had with Sir Patrick just before the short adjournment, which is, well, they, they'd have been a majority uh, in favour anyway, which anyway you, you, you look at it. Of course, the purpose of the industrial action ballot is essentially twofold. Firstly, obviously, to get over the minimum threshold set by the statute. But the second is, and we see it particularly in this case, to get the maximum yes vote, to put the maximum industrial pressure on the employer so that the employer is led to understand that there are not just 51% in favour, but 97.1%. So the union has an interest in not simply getting over the threshold, but in sending that industrial message alongside the requirement to comply with the statutory provisions as to uh, turnout. Um, if one then drops down, one can see uh, a, a, an interesting observation made by Mr Webb about what the union is going to attempt to do if so one looks at the last paragraph, what it shows is we're up against a significant machine that does not want us to win this battle. The only answer is for us to show our strength in the next couple of weeks. We will give you the resources, but the reality is that none of that matters unless we reach the front line. Get out there, whip the membership into a frenzy, and let's deliver the biggest yes vote in the union's history. We shall not be moved. And I pause at that observation by Mr. Webb, because the way that we say the membership were whipped into a frenzy was by creating a ballot process that took place in the workplace, as far as the union were able to do it. Sorry, uh, Mr. Carr, just remind me who Mr. Webb is in the Head of office. Communications. Head of Communications for the union. For the union, yes. And this is, is what, out to union reps? This will go on his Facebook page, so will be seen by a range of union reps, everybody who's a friend of his on Facebook, um, which will include, um, uh, we say, a, a, uh, a large number of union, union individuals. What I can say, of course, is that we don't have the benefit of any explanation from Mr. Webb about the degree of circulation that one had in relation to this document. Um, but the message that Mr. Webb was uh, creating, we can see, um, was spread uh, across the length and breadth of the country. So if you turn over to the next page, page 53, uh, we can see what we say is the, 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 the framework of the Get the Vote Out Week plan. And this is from the Northeast Region Communication Workers Union, their Facebook page, because um, 
your lordships will appreciate that you have Facebook accounts in the names of individuals, but also Facebook accounts in the name of organisations, and this is a, an example of the latter, um, where it said by the North East Region, CW, can you ensure every rep and every member sees this message? Please share key North Eastern Divisional message. Then it talks about a, uh, a um, gate meeting on the 24th. Can we ask every rep to hold a quick gate meeting on the 24th, ask our members to do the following. If our members live in the vicinity and are at work, we ask members to get their ballot paper, open it, vote yes, put in uppercase, seal it, return it immediately. If we do this across the division, we have a great chance of securing 100% turnout. So there is the clearest evidence that what was being done here was to create a workplace ballot in order to maximise the turnout. But it goes further than that, because the message then goes on, if we have a post box attached to the office, then video or take pictures of everyone posting their sealed vote, uh, their sealed vote yes ballot paper back into the post box, post this onto social media such as Facebook and Twitter, we want our mail distribution hubs, admin hubs, to do exactly the same to enhance the turnout of the vote. So the expectation, and I use that as the lowest level, putting it below instruction for the moment, the expectation of members was they would intercept, vote immediately, line up, allow themselves to be filmed in the full knowledge that that film was to be put onto social media for their colleagues to see. But that's not... But filming them putting it into a post box once it's been sealed can't be objectionable. In and of itself, it may not be. But if it's in the context of a continuum, which begins with interception of ballot papers and immediate voting, what the lineup does is it demonstrates compliance with the union's encouragement stroke instruction. So that if one sees oneself in the position of a, an individual postal worker who is at work on the day the ballot papers come in, who's known by his colleagues to live in the area that is served, that individual is going to feel under a substantial degree of pressure to do what his workmates may be doing and what the union has told is the expectation of him. Well, he may. He may. He may. He may, he, he, he may be somebody who is wholeheartedly in favour yes. of strike action. He may be somebody who is indifferent. He may be somebody who is totally against it. There are, of course, there will be a range of opinions. But, of course, the purpose of taking the balloting process away from the workplace is that the individual is free from the sort of pressures that would, in any situation, exist in the workplace, but even more so in circumstances where the union has created an expectation of its members that they will grab their papers, vote immediately, and line up. So when we turn in due course to look at the parliamentary materials, which demonstrate, alongside the Green Paper, that what the government was trying to secure by amending the legislation in 1993 was as far as possible to take the voting process away from the workplace, what the union have done is completely subvert that parliamentary intention. And they have procured it, or subverted it rather, with the express intention of trying to maximise the turnout and maximise the yes. So that is the North East region. That message um, on the North East region uh, Facebook page then gets promulgated within that division by reference to the document at page 175. <coughs> and 175 is a, is a Twitter feed because it's got the at and then the various... Um, tags that, that follow that. It's the Twitter feed that comes out from the same division. And I just take you to this document to show the, how, the extent to which the message was promulgated 
um, as a consequence of the uh, original Facebook page at 53. We can see it then goes to CWU Durham, Doncaster, York, Newcastle, uh, Errington, Errington Gary might be a person rather than a place, uh, Cleveland Amalgamated Union, Bradford, Hull, Leeds, uh, etc. So, promulgation within the North East. Uh, and then further promulgation, evidenced by page 182. explicit as to the first part of the continuum, but is very explicit or equally explicit as to the second part. So this is CWU Eastern number five, which is Peterborough. And I take you to this document because it links the process with the union's own document or the union's own flyer headed National Get the Vote Out Week. And I make the point again that the Union have not deigned to give this court or Mr Justice Swift any detail as to what was intended to be done in the course of National Get the Vote Out Week. But certainly the understanding within Peterborough is consistent with the message that was being put out by the North East. So from Wednesday, when the ballots start arriving, we need every office to be alive. We want queues at post boxes, photos, videos, a massive explosion of pride in the Union. And the reference to uh, cues at, at post boxes, photos and videos, we say is another indication of what, the, what was comprised within the continuum and is an indication of the understanding of that continuum uh, in the east of England, that being the Peterborough uh, document. We then move forward from the creation of the plan to the implementation stage. And the implementation stage begins with the <coughs> video at Stockton which we see it we can see it's still from it at page 54 and then the, the, the uh, what's been said at uh, page. 54 and 55. Um, and my Lord, what, what you've got is the transcript there. I'm, I'm aware that your Lordship's indicated, or your Lordship and Lady uh, indicated that um, you had watched those videos. Um, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to push, as it were, for them to be displayed in this courtroom if, if your Lordship's are satisfied that you've taken what you need to do so. I'm just conscious of the fact that when dealing with this question of instruction versus encouragement, um, it, it's, I would submit it was, uh, important, it was an important feature of, of the reasoning of Mr Justice Swift that he actually saw that video. But uh, I'm content... Well, we have seen it. You have seen so it. So we are in the same position you now, are in the judge. Same position. Um, I, I, I'm also conscious, of course, that there may be people both within this room and outside this room who haven't seen it. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not going to push for it to be to be played. But there it is. Um, what, what I would well, say it has, the, it has the status for whatever that is of material which the court has viewed. Uh, I'm grateful. What, what I would say about it is is when one looks at that video and hears the way in which the message is delivered, one can see why Mr. Justice Swift reached the conclusion in his judgment that the difference between instruction and encouragement was vanishingly small, is the words that he used. Um, and then went on to say, well, I take the view it is an instruction, but even if it falls slightly short of an instruction, it's enough to amount to, to uh, part of the picture of, uh, of interference. There's um, some union endorsement of that at more senior level, at page 106, where you have um, an extract from the Facebook page of um, Mole Mead, 
Uh, and just to show my ignorance, I assumed that that was either a place or a pseudonym. It is neither, as I understand it, because Mr. Mole Mead is in fact uh, a member of the National Executive Council of the Union. <coughs> And he is displaying stills of that same meeting that we just looked at at page 54, 53 and 54. Um, and <coughs> Mr. Mead's comment uh, as follows, well, it's not terribly legible, but I, I, I can tell you what I believe it to say. Watching Northeast Div Division Bob Maguire smashed the yes vote at Stockton Delivery Office. So there is an endorsement from a member of the National Executive Committee of the instruction, as we describe it, given by Mr. Maguire to those at the gate. Uh, and he also goes on to say this, a fantastic gate meeting at Stockton with members fully engaged with the CWU message. So <laughs> there is the clearest uh, indication that the message that was being promulgated in the Northeast that we've seen in Peterborough and will see in Swansea at the moment was the CWU message. I'm still not sure why you call this an instruction, actually. When I think of an instruction as being something where there's a plain sanction if you don't comply, I do understand the notion that it's encouragement in a context where the union officials will have a high expectation that the membership will go along with it, and creating an environment, they want to create an environment where that is the norm. But I have to say, it seems to me instruction is just a, a false word for it, really. Well, it's um, to have something more than that. It, it, it may be that we end up in that vanishingly small place identified by Mr. Justice Swift in, in his judgment. Uh, what I say is, is that it, it does amount to an instruction because it is, it is telling the members what is expected of them. Um, well, what the union hopes of them. Is that wrong? Well, I mean, the union is going to say, look, we want you to vote in accordance with our... It's inevitable. Let's assume for a moment that um, we weren't taking uh, um, ballot papers out of the frame and they had gate meetings and the union official was saying, we want you all to vote yes, that's what we're expecting from you, that's what the union wants, that's what we think we need to win this fight. Um, you wouldn't complain about that, would you? A mere exhortation to vote yes is not something that I would be entitled to complain of. A prescriptive <laughs> method by which members are expect with which members are expected to comply, and I put it that high, uh, whether or not one wants to say that uh, that's, an expect that's an instruction or not, I, I will put to one side, but I will put it as high as it is a prescriptive method which is put forward by the trade union with which the expectation is that members will comply. And one has to put oneself in, one in the shoes for a moment, I say, <coughs> of the member at that meeting, for example, with, with Mr. Maguire. What does he take away from that meeting? He's taking away from that meeting that the union has given me a series of instructions as to how I am to behave when my, when my ballot paper comes into the, the, the delivery office. Well, there we are. There, there we are. That's yeah. a submission. It is a submission, but, but my fallback position would be this, that even if one wants to um, uh, take a, a, um, a sufficiently prescriptive um, definition of the word instruction and say I fall outside that because it doesn't comply with um, your Lordship's understanding of what an instruction is, uh, it doesn't matter because what the union has created is a set of uh, expectations or obligations which the members are expected to comply with. I understand that, but it seems to me you're using the word instruction to give it some kind of um, moral criticism. Um, uh, and, and, and well, it, it may it may it may be that that um, uh, I have 
uh, gone on to that, I have gone on to use that word um, as a counter to Mr. Hendy's suggestion that this is mere encouragement. Um, because the reality is it's not, it's not mere encouragement at all. It's, 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 it's putting the members in a situation where what's expected of them when they come into work the next morning is that they will take their papers off the frame, vote immediately and get in line. And anybody who's in that office that day who doesn't do that will be immediately known to their colleagues and we will receive questions, well, how come you haven't done it? We've all done it. Where, where's, have you got your ballot paper? Where is it? And the opportunity for that individual to take away his ballot paper and say, well, what's he going to do? Is he going to say, no, I'm not going to post it yet. I want to go home and think about it. He's under enormous pressure when the members are whipped into a frenzy to comply with what the union has said he should do. But, my Lord, That's I, your point, really, isn't it? Whether, whether one calls it encouragement or um, instruction or use the word exhortation, which maybe occupies that vanishingly small space. But um, the point is that somebody who doesn't go along with what is being proposed will stand out as somebody who has not conformed with the encouragement or whatever it is. Yes, absolutely. And, and it perhaps rather than... Um, uh, spend too much time debating the nuances of the difference between instruction and exhortation. Uh, I can just put it simply this way, to say that that is the wrong side of the line. Because it's not simply, we want you all to vote and we want you to vote yes. It's, it's, it's setting out a particular mechanism, a particular process. It's not just... Can you vote as early as possible? Can you really get the vote out early? It is, do this in order to get the vote out early. And do it in the company of your colleagues in the office. And Mr Hendy, or sorry, apologies, Lord Hendy, uh, makes a lot of the fact that there aren't any complaints uh, from uh, particular individuals about this. And, well, that's not really the test. Um, the test is whether the ballot papers, whether the ballot process satisfies the requirements uh, of Part Five, and just as it would have been difficult for individuals in the sorting offices, in the frenzy that Mr. Webb wanted to create, to stand out and say, "No, I'm not going to do that," it's equally difficult for them to stand out and make a complaint. Imagine if there's a a delivery officer or a postal worker in a, in a particular office who takes a dim view of what is done, is he really, is he really going to put his head above the parapet and say, right to the scrutineer and say, look, I'm in Peterborough delivery office and this is what's gone on and I'm not happy with it. So you can't use the absence of complaint as, a, a definite, as by definition an indicator that everybody's fine with this. And even if they were fine with it, that is not the test. The test is whether the ballot has been done in accordance with the statutory framework that's been put in place. Um, we then have um, Mr Williams as the uh, next indication of um, the plan. Uh, we've got Mr Williams' statement, which you'll have seen as Lordships have let in as a supplementary statement, and he says, well, it's all his idea, and uh, there it is. It, it, it's remarkably similar in terms of the message that he promotes when set alongside the messages from other areas that we've looked at already. The difference, of course, is, and without wishing to go, to go back into the debate that we've just tried to exclude from consideration at the moment, the difference is that Mr. Williams' message is very much in mandatory language. If one looks at page 56, don't forget, ballot papers dispatched today, as soon as you receive yours, put an X in the yes box, get it back as soon as possible. Delivery members, don't even take yours home. If you live in the catchment area, get it filled out and sent back before you go on delivery. That doesn't look like, as it were, mere encouragement. Um, it, it is certainly uh, over the line in terms of producing a prescriptive method by which the high turnout 
and high yes vote uh, is to be procured by the union. So we have the plan, we have the plan being implemented immediately before the ballot papers go out. We then have a raft of evidence demonstrating that this was done across the length and breadth of the country. And, my lords, can I just, I'm not, there are, I think, 81 examples within the statement produced by uh, Mr. McCauley. If one merely confines oneself to the 25th of September for the moment, and merely confines oneself to the examples of the plan operating to produce large numbers of individuals voting in accordance with the union's instruction, you still have tens of delivery offices on that one day where many people have been photographed on social media doing uh, what the union um, said they should do. And um, I'm reluctant to spend time going through each and every one of them. I wonder whether I could just give your lordships a, a list of uh, page numbers that demonstrate the activity being carried out on the 25th of September, the most important ones. It's not a, it's not a complete list, um, but it is uh, some of the most egregious examples, we say, of the plan coming out in the way that the union wanted it to do. Um, so it's, it's uh, 57 to 59 at Swansea, 63 to 66 at Hull, page 70 at Orpington, 71, I will pause that for a moment please if I can, because that is important. Uh, because it's part of um, a three page section, which it goes beyond three pages, it goes to four pages, dealing with Facebook messages from the Plymouth and East Cornwall uh, branch of the CWU, and we can see first voting media of the day. So by 6.30 on the 25th, we can see that in that part of the world, people are starting to remove their ballot papers uh, and vote. Um, over the page, the voting is filmed. The message, keep them coming. And then the message on the next page, lads, literally thousands of postal workers have done this up and down the land, including me personally, and almost every rep in the CWU has. And that is a comment that appears beneath the photographs that we see in 71 and 72. So it would suggest that literally thousands were removing the ballot papers and just voting openly uh, within the workplace. Um, then a few more examples, um, 76 Bolton, 78 Wigan, 79 Warrington, and I will pause at that for a moment, because that does uh, generate uh, a point that goes beyond merely demonstrating the amount of people that queued up. If one looks at page 79, first of all, the extent to which the union plan has generated workplace votes, illustrated by the size of the queue. There are scores of individuals lining up, and the comment from the region CWU, what a great picture of our members at Warrington Delivery Office. I'm going to take a punt and say they're voting yes. And if one just goes a couple of pages over to page 81, um, the TUC Northwest picked up on this post. I think we can technically call this a workplace ballot. 
great union organisation on display, but it makes the restrictions on balloting in the workplace all the more ridiculous. Um, I'm going to leave the examples of that. Um, there are, as I say, dozens of photographs of individuals queuing at post boxes on the 25th, from which the only logical inference we say to draw is the extent to which they were complying with what the union had suggested they might do, to put it at its, at its lowest. And um, just a couple more Sorry, the, the, the last section of my submissions on this point was, was the uh, ex post facto endorsement of the process by, um, by the union uh, itself. I've taken you already to page 106, which was um, NEC member Mr Mead um, describing Mr Maguire as smashing the yes vote in the gate meeting that we saw. Um, then over at page 107, and... Um, Again, this is important in terms of the frenzy that the union were attempting to whip up, uh, because Mr Mead says this on the 25th, what a brilliant first day, ballot papers still to land in many units, please keep this going, it's been great so far, but we need many photos, more videos and more meetings, turnout is absolutely crucial, critical and we cannot let up. So there is a, an NEC member telling anybody who saw this and anybody who they then spoke to that what the union was wanting was more examples of people retrieving their ballot papers, voting and queuing up to demonstrate what they've done. And it comes beneath a photograph or a series of photographs, one of which includes the Warrington queue, another of which appears to show a member at his frame um, possibly even in the act of voting. It's difficult to see from the photograph. But um, any, any union member who had any contact with his representative at or around this time would know that what the union was expecting of its members was to, to form a queue, get the turnout up, get the yes vote out. And This seems to have a logo with 97.1% on it, which seems remarkably prescient. Yes, well, I, I think it, it is remarkably prescient, but what I assume is that when he changes his logo at a later date, it then picks up on, the, on, on, on any process. prior message, because um, it, would be a, it would be a rather odd message to send, wouldn't it, after the ballot had closed, to say that we need more of this. Uh, and I take comfort from the date rather than 97.1. Yes. But if this is sent at the end of the first day, by that time, the um, opportunity to pick up the... Uh, ballots envelopes from the frames will have gone because if they if they haven't been picked up presumably the postman will have taken them and they'll have been delivered some, some are still to land in many units exactly so. yeah so so um i don't want to make too many comments about the efficiency of the postal service because that would be <laughs> slightly <laughs> inimical to my client's wider interests but it's inevitably the case that some will arrive to be delivered on the 25th, some will yeah, some, arrive to be delivered on the, on the 26th. Yes, yes. but I, I've, I've focused my submissions on the 25th, because <coughs> that's, the, that's the clearest example, but, but I do say that the 26th example is where, again, you have large queues of individuals. What's ha what must have happened in relation to those individuals is one of two things. Either they've brought their papers in from home, having picked them up on the evening of the 25th, or they've arrived in the... Uh, relevant delivery office on the 26th rather than on the 25th. Yes. Whereas because the one on the 25th you could say that could only have been taken from the frames. Exactly. Yes. There's no, there's, yes, it, yes. It, it's, no, it's logistically not conceivable that mm -hmm. by 20 past 6 in the morning on the 25th for example, somebody's had it delivered come back into the office. But there it is. Um, then just a couple more on this, uh, on this point and then I'll, I'll leave the evidence. Um, So 142, and I take you to this one because it's, it's um, social media that is uh, likely to be a very widespread. 
um, Milford Haven, they just keep getting better. And then 164, says of somebody who's plainly opened their paper, um, allowed themselves to be filmed, has to be said by the trade union or on the trade union's behalf, because it ends up on the trade union website, this is happening. And the this that is happening, of course, is workplace balloting. picture that Mr Justice Swift had, we said it was very clear as to what, what had been done, why it had been done, how effective it had been, create a workplace ballot for the express purpose of increasing the yes vote and increasing the turnout. And whilst I don't take a lot of um, particular faith from what Mr Williams has said in his statement, he actually concedes the point for me, because he says that he put out his message for the express purpose of trying to get the turnout above the 50% required. So there it is. It's clear it's an admission from a senior individual within that particular branch that what he was doing, what he regarded himself as doing, was making sure that it went above 50%. And of course this is one of the objections that the trade unions, some would say perfectly legitimately have with postal voting, is that it means the postal, the, the ballot paper gets stuck behind the fireplace, or the dogs at my ballot paper, or I can't be bothered to vote. And why the trade unions have been pushing for workplace balloting, even now, and electronic voting, and increasing the methods by which one can vote, is specifically so that they can get closer to the threshold that's required under statute. But they, they don't have that facility at the moment. So what this union was in a unique position to do and did was create something that Parliament hadn't given them. Parliament hadn't given them the opportunity of organising a ballot that took place at work. Of course Parliament couldn't prevent Mr Bloggs, the postman, from taking his ballot paper into work. Of course they couldn't prevent him and his mates sitting around the canteen deciding what they can do. But what Parliament could do is say to the trade union, you have to hold a ballot, you have to organise a ballot that complies with the statutory framework. And the statutory framework is one pursuant to which, in the ordinary course, the ballot paper goes into the post, is received at home, can be considered at home, doesn't have to be, take it wherever he wherever likes, like, doesn't have to be, can be considered at home, and then the outcome of that process committed back into the post. That is what is supposed to happen. And that is what most definitely did not happen in this case. For the express purpose identified by Mr Williams and others, we wanted to get the turnout up. Right, where do we go now? We go briefly to the judgment. And I will um, walk you through this very quickly if I can, please. I just want to... begins at page 62 of the core bundle. <coughs> I've taken mine out, actually, so perhaps you could give us ah, paragraph yes. numbers it's, as well. Yes, I'm, go I'm going to take you all um, to paragraph... I'm just going to do the decision part, and I'm not going to do, deal with the rest. Uh -huh. So the decision... Uh, section of the judgment begins at paragraph 20. Paragraph 22, uh, the judge's conclusion that the um, the union will not succeed at trial in showing that what it did complied with section 230, and he touches on RJB mining. And um, 
categorizes the interference as being improper, so at the, wrong, the wrong side of the line. Uh, then says, um, the amendment to section 230, remove the option of workplace ballots, postal ballots became the sole method, and I'll make submissions on that in due course. In paragraph 23, he deals with uh, interference and uh, reaches his conclusion that the um, campaigning went beyond a legitimate campaign and uh, amounted to um, inter interference with the process. Uh, he then disposes of the um, arguments relating to Paul and Nalgo at paragraph 24. Paragraph 25, I say, is, is important in, in that uh, it's, obviously I commend the whole of the judgment to you because uh, it was in my favour. Um, but paragraph 25, uh, I say, uh, does very clearly illustrate uh, the unreality of, of the submissions made by the CWU and which continue to be made by... Um, Mr. Hendy, to the, or Lord Hendy, to the effect that the union's responsibility begins and ends when the letter goes in, into the post as a result of the ballot papers and addresses having been supplied to the independent scrutineer, because the way that it was done in this case was the same as it's done in many cases, which is rather than the union being responsible for the posting, that's done by the independent scrutineer who's given the names and addresses and then sends off the ballot paper. Um, it, it, it simply cannot be right that the union's responsibility ends at the point at which the envelope is put into the post by ERS. Parliament hasn't legislated to include the words posted and received at home. The answer being that Parliament doesn't legislate specifically by reference to the circumstances that prevail in Royal Mail. It legislates by reference to the generality of the balloting process. And it legislates in the knowledge that if an item is put into the post, one can expect that in the normal course it will be received at home by the individual. And as we said below, and I say again, the CWU was in a unique position here to prevent the statutory purpose being achieved. The statutory purpose being he should receive it at home. What he does after is, is up to him. But the CWU, by telling its members that they should retrieve their papers from the frame, which of course is within the workplace, prevents that statutory purpose of being complied with because the ballot paper is received in the workplace rather than at home. And it can't be right that the duty is discharged at the point at which ERS puts the letters into the letterbox because that allows, uh, if Mr Henley was right about that, then we could have an instruction, we could have an express instruction to trade union members. You must take your ballot papers from the frame. And by the CWU analysis of Section 232, that would be fine. The union's done its job. It got the letters into the post. The fact that it totally countermanded that process by telling its members to take the ballot paper at home, at work rather than consider it at home, that would be fine on Mr Hendy's analysis. And that simply can't be right, we say. Um, then paragraph 26 we have it deals with the uh, instruction 26 and 27 it deals with the instruction point and the, that's where we find the vanishingly small reference um, that I've taken you to um, he then makes the point of paragraph 28 which is a point that I've already made both orally and in my written submissions that um, the CWU case has not been assisted by the fact that they have not sought to explain uh, what and why uh, the messages that we rely on were communicated by officials within the trade union. Save, of course, belatedly in relation to Mr Williams, who said it was all off his own bat, but there it is. For example, we don't have Mr Maguire explaining 
uh, how it came to be that he was issuing the instruction that he did. And the judge's conclusion, and I say he was entitled to reach that conclusion, was that the absence of a explanation from the union served only to make Royal Mail's case stronger. Um, and then uh, he goes to the end of his analysis at paragraphs 29 and 30 and then deals briefly at 31, 32 and 33 and 34 with the alternative arguments uh, and I lost on points A and B but one on point C of the points identified in paragraph 31. And that is a briefest of canters through the judgment, just so that one can see how the judge went about it. Um, yes. And perhaps I ought to just, just flag up, which you have spotted already, that the 234 uh, element of the decision, paragraph 33 and 34, and I wonder if I can just at this stage make one point in relation to that uh, by reference to the statute. Um, just cover it briefly now and then I, I can deal with it very shortly when I come to make more submissions on the particular points in issue in the case. What I say one takes from paragraph 34... needs to be seen in the context of the particular statutory obligation set out in section 230, subsection 4. And the way in which we put the case and the finding that the judge made uh, is based on that particular wording. So, my lords, if I could take you to tab 1 of the authorities bundle uh, towards the back about three pages from the back, one has 230 sub 4. Ballot should, shall be conducted so as to cure, so far as is reasonably practicable, that those doing so do so in, in, in secret. And the way in which we put our case below, and I put it again today, is to say that what Swansea demonstrates is the absence of any steps being taken to secure that voting takes place in secret. And I add to that those uh, items which were identified in the annex to my uh, written submissions, which show, as it were, open voting. And this is again where the absence of any evidence from the trade union has left the judge, we say, with a conclusion that was perfectly open to him and permissible uh, on the evidence that he saw because the union put no evidence in to demonstrate any step having been taken to ensure that the process that it had or the plan that it had put into place did not result in voting taking place other than in secret. So what one could have had, for example, is the Stockton Gate meeting. Mr. Maguire saying, this is what we like you to do, lads. By the way, just to remind you, it's a secret ballot. So when you do put your cross in it, just go to one side, do it in a quiet corner, if that's what you want to do. And that reasonably practicable step will have reduced the risk of what we see in Swansea and what we say are evidenced by a number of the stills uh, that, that are referred to in the annex to my skeleton argument. So if you, so, and this is, this, this is slightly Alice in Wonderland element about this submission because it's, it's, it's in a circumstance in which you're left solely with section 234. It almost assumes as though I've lost on section 231 and section 232. But the way the submission runs is, even if you can treat somehow the process that the union put in place as surviving scrutiny under Section 230 and 232, if you then look at 234, having put that in place, they did nothing to prevent the risk of the frenzy creating other than secret voting. And that's the way in which the submission was, was put below, and that's the way in which I, I commend it to you. 
Uh, the judge does seem to found his conclusion on section 234 solely on Swansea. He doesn't say, yes. and I infer that um, all sorts of things were going on elsewhere in the country. I, 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 I entirely accept that, which is part of the reason why I've sought to add the additional material, uh, because if one were concerned about the narrowness of the evidential platform for that finding, there is other material which supports it, on which I rely. So, um, Lords, I'm conscious of the fact that I'm taking things quickly because I'm equally conscious that I need to leave Mr. Lord Henry time to reply yes. uh, and um, uh, that we need to conclude the argument um, today. Um, if I can deal with the law now, uh, my, my starting point, Lord, is not dissimilar from the starting point of, of Maloney Friends, which is... Um, Tab 15, BA and Unite in the Court of Appeal, paragraph 15. The last page of the judgment. <clears throat> and although this was a passage that was uh, alighted on by Lord Hendy, it, it's actually something that, that uh, uh, I say assists the Royal Mail's case. Um, at paragraph 152, um, policy is not to create a series of traps or hurdles to ensure fair dealing between the employer and the union, to ensure fair and open democratic ballot. And uh, 153, I can see that if there is an infringement which affects some aspect of those important policy requirements, the ballot must be held to be invalid. And then there is the escape route of, of minor infringements. But, uh, of course, it's helpful in the context of that observation that Lord Hendy doesn't seek to run a de minimis or substantial compliance argument uh, in relation to Section 231 and Section 232. And we say, first of all, there is uh, a policy issue underpinning all of our arguments. Uh, and secondly, what the union did substantially infringed upon that, those policy requirements. Uh, a point I made in opening just before lunch, um, I just want to tease out a little bit more if I can whilst we're on uh, in tab 15. Uh, if one goes back to paragraph 113, One sees the observation that I think Lord Hendy took you to this morning where uh, Lady Justice Smith says the provision is quite detailed and imposes considerable demands on the union. It seems to me important to recognise that they are not designed to prevent unions from organising strikes or to make it so difficult that it will be impracticable for them so to do. That is not this case. Uh, as I indicated just before we broke for lunch, we know that this trade union has successfully managed a ballot of essentially the same workforce in 2017 and managed a ballot in relation to parcel force in 2019. And Lord Hendy's comment um, in relation to the argument about workplace balloting, that it was, as it were, not incumbent upon the trade union to understand that the legislation doesn't entitle them to do what they've done, uh, is with respect, uh, uh, perhaps an admission that they didn't take any legal advice. I don't know whether Lord Hendy's trying to talk himself out of a job, but one com completely understands that a degree of legal analysis is required in order to ensure that there is compliance with the statutory framework. But you can't determine compliance or non-compliance by saying, well, well, you can't expect the union to understand. <clears throat> Maybe right. Don't expect Mr. Pullinger or Mr. Ward to have 
a detailed knowledge of Part 5 of the 1992 Act, but that's why he has lawyers to advise him. And we say that any, anybody looking for a moment from a legal standpoint at this plan would have raised a red flag. And it appears from the evidence and inferentially from what Mr. from what Lord Hendy has said, that the union simply went ahead and did this. Without, see, I don't know whether they sought advice or not, but that's the inference I draw from Mr. Hendy saying, uh, Lord Hendy saying, well, it's not incumbent on the union to understand what the statute expected of them. Well, I think he, he said that only in the context of um, an understanding of the antecedent history of the legislation and the fact that the workplace opportunity for voting had been removed 23 years ago. So he may have said it in that particular context, but the, but the, the, the point still holds good, of course, that, that it was said in the context of whether the antecedent legislation led you to the conclusion that you shouldn't be organising ballots within the workplace. Yeah. It wasn't incumbent upon the union to have that level of understanding by reference to the previous legislation. Well, that's why you have lawyers. That's why you take advice on the point. Um, that that um, takes me um, neatly, but not deliberately, to the prior legislation. Um, and I, I'm not quite sure where we've come out after Lord Hendy's submissions on the extent to which we are entitled to look at the prior legislation in order to understand the policy and mischief in relation to the current legislation. Um, because my submission is it is plainly appropriate for a court to look at earlier legislation that has been amended in order to understand the mischief that was intended to be addressed or the policy that was intended to be addressed by the process of amendment. Exactly as your ladyship did in the Balfour and British Airways case, where there was extensive examination of the changes to the, if I can call it reporting requirements or notification requirements that a union has in relation to categories. Similar exercise that um, uh, Sir Patrick undertook in, in RMT and Serco in examining prior legislation in order to understand context, policy, mischief, it, that, that, the, that the process of amendment is, is there to address. Um, and, and as Lady Justice Smith did in um, British Airways, in fact, uh, talking about uh, another major concern was workplace balance. It seems yes. to me this particular ship may have sailed. Yes, well, uh, and I, I, I would accept that if one is looking at a, an issue of construction of a word or phrase within an act, one construes that not by reference to the prior legislation. But if one is looking to the mischief or policy that underpins the amendment, it's a different story. Um, and I say it's a, it's a matter of routine for courts to examine prior legislation in order to understand the policy context mischief in relation to the subsequent legislation. Uh, and, and if that's right, then one is entitled to look at the uh, original version of section 230 in order to see what was taken out, because that helps one to understand the policy or intent that underlay the amendment that was made in 1993. I hope that your lordships were sent, um, literally only electronically, um, copies of the two thirds section 230 in its original format. If, if you, if you, if you don't have it, I have copies. Uh, no, we've got that, thank you, I think. Thank you. Um, so if, if one looks at the um, old, the original 1992 version, uh, one can see that what was uh, originally allowed at section 232 was that every person should be supplied with a voting paper or have one made available to him immediately before, immediately after, or during his working hours at his place of work. So receipt of ballot paper allowed at place of work. 
And then at 2.33, so far as reasonably practical, every person entitled to vote must be given a convenient opportunity to vote by post or an opportunity to vote immediately before, after, or during his working hours. So both ends of the uh, exercise were contemplated as things that could be done in the in, at the workplace. Both receipt and the actual act of voting could both be done in, in the workplace. We then have um, the new version of section 230, uh, and we can see that 232 and 3 have been repealed. And what we say lies behind the uh, repeal is that ballots were to be fully posted. And the other uh, matter that is of, of interest, we say, from section 230, uh, is something that Lord Hendy said wasn't important, but I say uh, actually it is quite important. Um, uh, and that is section 232A and B. Because what Parliament has done at 232A and 2B is recognise that a fully postal balloting process will be problematic in the case of merchant seamen. And so a carve-out from the obligation to carry out fully, po fully uh, postal balloting processes, processes uh, is made for merchant seamen. And what essentially has been done is that the old version of section 232, uh, 232 and 233 have been rewritten but substantially applied to the case of merchant seamen. So everybody has had the workplace balloting process taken away from them, save for merchant seamen in relation to whom it's obviously going to be problematic because they may be at sea for extended periods of time to um, require that that individual receives his ballot by post at his home, maybe in the other side of the world for months on end. Um, so that limited exception is, the, again, a clear example of what Parliament was recognising, which was that we couldn't have fully postal balloting in relation to everybody. There was this small group of individuals for whom we needed to retain an element of workplace balloting, both in terms of receipt and in terms of casting one's vote. In view of the change, section 234A is rather superfluous, really, isn't it? In um, the standard case, you'll get the votes going to somebody's home, and they will um, be able to exercise their right to vote in their own home. I'm not quite sure what 4A then bites on. 4A might bite on this situation, that you might have a union that is not in the position to intercept the ballot papers, but says to its workers, or says to its members rather, when these ballot papers are received, come into the union office, or come meet up and we'll, we'll all vote together. Bring them into the canteen and we'll all vote together. So, it, it, it's a, so you, that, that wouldn't amount to an infringement of section 230, it's 232, but may amount to a, a, an infringement of section 234A. And of course, it, whilst we're on 4A, it's, it's um, a ballot shall be conducted, uh, so far as reasonably practical, a ballot shall be conducted by the union. So of course it's not there to prevent Mr. Smith going into the pub with his ballot paper and sitting around uh, with, his, with his friends. It is because one wouldn't expect the union to, to proscribe that form of voting, but uh, it, it is to allow for, we say, for the possibility that, that, that uh, the union might uh, suggest the voting process. Um, I think a more natural reading would be that it was necessary when they had workplace ballots and they just hadn't got rid of it. But anyhow, you may be right, it would cover that situation. Well, and 
as my instructor just to helpfully point out, of course, a Swansea type of situation. It's a very good example where... Um, if, no, I understand if, that, but only in the context of this particular union, that's the point. No, 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 I take it, I no, Lord, no, I, t I take it that stage further, because uh, any union could say to it... Well, no, I, I have your point, ah, I saw right. an extreme, but I, I hardly think that's what Parliament had in mind when they left this in place, but there we are, maybe they did. Well, it, it, um, whether or not it's superfluous doesn't undermine my argument. And I suppose the ship for the merchant seaman is both his workplace and his temporary home. I mean, he'll have a cabin either his own or sharing with somebody else, and that will be where he lives while he's off duty, um, but uh, still on, on the ship. Yes, but it, it goes a little bit further than that, I would suggest, because uh, it, th there won't in the normal course be a post box uh, into which he can post his ballot, um, and he won't have as his postal address. Um, but I, I accept the parallel that your Lordship draws. I think uh, what I would suggest is it, it's... it's uh, it's um, a provision that's, that's born of the realities of trying to allow um, probably the RMT, wouldn't it be, or um, union. Well, you've got to do something about them because it, um, yes, otherwise, exactly. you can't, you can't uh, leave them in a position where they, can't, where, they, where they can't vote postally because they're away. So that one, one allows for a, a, a different regime in respect of that. Um, well, Lord, can I, can I then, uh, just to uh, finish on this um, policy and intention point, take you to the um, parliamentary materials which we've uh, added. And um, just before I, I look at those, could I just take you very briefly to the extract from Benyon that we've included at tab 22. Where um, the authors set out um, their understanding of the current state of the law in relation to references to Hansard outside Pepper and Hart um, and the rule that's set out or their understanding of the rule is is um, Hansard may be referred to outside the rule in Pepper and Hart to supply context or identify the mischief at which the legislation was aimed and then um, uh, in the fourth line of the next paragraph rather to supply context and identify the nature and extent of the social problem at which legislation is aimed. To this extent the cases seem to provide support for a wider relaxation of the exclusionary rule based on Pepper and Hart uh, and then um, two examples are given, one from the um, Supreme Court and the other from the Privy Council, both of which we say um, demonstrate relaxation of or sorry, the operation of a rule outside Pepper and Hart for, um, as it were, less precise, um, less precise circumstances than those that actually prevail in Pepper and Hart. So you're not looking at Hansard for the purposes of resolving an ambiguity. You're looking at Hansard for the purpose of mischief policy or context. Um, and Lord Andy's already taken you to um, some of the. Uh, passages within the green paper and uh, it may be um, helpful just to flag up a, a couple of points uh, page 8 in tab 23 reference paragraph 316 to um, fully postal voting and independent scrutiny. And then the um, justification for that across the page at page 9. Fully postal. At that point, there was they were considering whether there should be a... Um, 
a different position in relation to ballots of less than 50. In fact, they came out that everybody has to have postal ballots, but less than 50, you don't have to have an independent scrutiny. Yet, so that's where they came out at. But um, uh, again, the reference at 322, in all other cases, fully postal voting provides a greater assurance that voting will be in secret and, f and free from uh, intimidation. Um, if one then turns to the debates in the House of Lords when the, um, and the second reading of the bill, uh, one sees at page 13 of the parliamentary materials, the parliamentary undersecretary for the Department of Employment uh, introducing the moving that the bill be read, the bill should have its second reading. And um, the relevant passages that I would take your lordships to Um, page 16, in the middle of the page, clauses 16 and 19 is the paragraph that I would like to take you to. Update the law on strike ballots. Voting must be conducted by fully postal balloting, uh, subject to independent scrutiny. This, this will help to ensure the proper conduct of ballots by allowing votes to be cast away from the pressures to which voters may be exposed in the workplace. And then the same point made by the Under Secretary of State at page 19. As we made clear in the 1991 Green Paper and in the manifesto, we believe the best way of ensuring industrial action ballots are conducted democratically without impropriety is to ensure that each of those entitled to vote, with, uh, each of those entitled to vote, with the opportunity to do so by post. <coughs> so, um, parliamentary intention indicated by the nature of the amendment, the carve-out for merchant seamen, the contents of the Green Paper, the debates in the House of Lords on introduction of the second reading, all demonstrate, we say, that the intention of Parliament was that the balloting process should be a fully postal one as far as reasonably practicable. And of course it didn't prescribe restrictions on individuals, you must vote at home, um, because the obligation is an obligation on the union, as we've seen from section 226 of the 1992 Act. This is all about creating a framework within which the union can properly and safely operate a balloting process without infringing uh, on the parliamentary intention as evidenced by the points that I've just taken you to. Legislation has been in place for 26 years. There have been hundreds, if not thousands, of ballots that have been successfully conducted by trade unions up and down the country without infringing on Section 230. And certainly in researching for this case, I don't think either my learned friend or myself found any particular authorities on Section 230 beyond RJB mining. Uh, it is a process with which unions have been able to comply without difficulty for 26 years. That This union has been able to comply with without difficulty on previous occasions. And so when one puts on the lens of Article 11 and asks oneself the question, as to whether this framework and these particular provisions make it inordinately difficult for the union to exercise, or to, the union to enable its members to exercise Article 11 rights, it takes the union no further. They could have complied with Section 230. Nothing particularly problematic about it as demonstrated by other ballots that they and other unions have conducted. Section 231 
So those, those are my submissions in relation to Section 230 broadly and the way that Lord Hendy dealt with them. If I move on now to Section 231, um, the first point that I need to draw out is in relation to um, a couple of decisions relied on by Lord Hendy, one of which was accepted by the judge and one uh, was not. Um, Tab 5, my lord, you have the decision in Paul in which the certification officer had made the observation at paragraph uh, 64 that conduct covered by, uh, sorry, conduct which would amount to interference uh, needed to be something that would intimidate or put a member in a fear of voting or amount to physical interference. Now, first point to make about this, Lord, is, is of course this was decided uh, in 1987 before the um, provisions that we rely on even came into force. There is another certification officer decision which dealt with the law as it existed. Um, no, actually, I, that's a false point. Um, because the equivalent provisions would have been in place for union elections, not for ballots. Um, but I do make this point that we do have at um, tab six a subsequent decision of the, a successor to the role of certification officer dealing with the um, provisions of section 55 of the 1992 Act in relation to the conduct, con conduct of elections for the post of officials. And it, that's why you've got section 51 in your tab of authorities at the beginning, because if you just flip back very quickly to um, about three or four pages in, actually maybe on the first page of tab one, section 51, you'll see the, um, the equivalent provision to section 230, but in the context of voting for certain posts within the union rather than conducting an industrial action ballot. And what Parliament did when it made the amendments that it did in 1993 was to borrow the framework that existed in relation to the election of union officials and transpose it into the process by which industrial action ballots are conducted. So you have at section 230, uh, sorry, section 51.3, every person who's entitled to vote must be allowed to, without interference or constraint. So identical wording to section 231. And um, uh, this was a case, just so that it has one some context, because the context is quite interesting in this case, because it was the, con the context was a complaint in relation to the conduct of a ballot for um, a position within the union in relation to ballots which had been conducted in Northern Ireland. So two prisons in Northern Ireland. Um, if one goes back to 1996, um, and probably even today, one can understand that those who are employed in the prison service or in the armed forces or in the police in Northern Ireland are very sensitive about their addresses being known outside their workplace. And so that created a particular problem for the trade union uh, in that how do you get the ballot papers to individuals who don't want their addresses released to any broader constituency. And the way in which the union, broadly speaking, did it was not with any intent to subvert the process particularly. They took it upon themselves to organise the distribution and collection of ballot papers from individuals who were employed within these two prisons in Northern Ireland. And. Um, <coughs> The conclusion reached by the certification officer um, was that that amounted to a breach of the scheme. So if one looks at um, the complaint, Uh, the complaint is paragraph 2.19, um, 
where we can see the complainants allege that HMP reps of the union required, encouraged or permitted uh, voting members to return their completed ballots to the union where the um, statutory requirement was for members to be given a convenient opportunity to, uh, to vote by post. The reasons for the decision at 229... I must look at the whole scheme of the legislation to see if this can be right, because an interpretation of that would mean that elections need not be fully postal. In my view, the intention behind the balloting provisions was to make such ballots fully postal and not just to provide the option of uh, voting by post. Clearly intended uh, to take control over the ballot papers outside the hands of union officials. Now, I accept that in this case there is a slight difference in that we don't have as yet sufficient evidence to show that the union took control, but nevertheless the legislative purpose which was identified by the certification officer uh, in that case is um, very similar to what I say is the legislative <coughs> purpose in this case. And the other important point to take away from the uh, decision of the certification officer is that he revisited the... Um, the decision in Paul, which had been reached by his predecessor, uh, at paragraph 2.7. Sorry, paragraph 2.7 is where the union puts, puts Paul into the frame, as it were. 2.16. Thank you. So the union raises Paul and says, well, it's limited to... Um, uh, conduct as would intimidate or put a member in fear of voting or amount to physical interference. And then uh, certific certification officer Mr. Wybrew uh, acknowledges that uh, Paul has been the guiding case up to that date and indeed acknowledges that he himself has followed that approach um, but then reaches the conclusion at 2.17 in this case, I've heard no evidence from an individual member of intimidation or physical interference. However, the complaint is that the system inherently interferes or imposes that constraint. I'm satisfied that the election was compromised because ballot papers before and after completion fell into the hands of the union officers of the union. The importance of that is to show that one doesn't have to uh, <coughs> demonstrate uh, intimidation, physical interference. Uh, one is looking to see whether the plan or arrangements which have been put in place by the union amount to an interference or constraint, uh, and we say that they were. So, of interest, do we know who this officer, what the certification officer at this time? Fred Wybrew. I think he died earlier this year. I think I saw his obituary as I was trying to, I had exactly the same train of thought as as your lordship, but it was uh, Fred Wybrew uh, uh, was the man in question. So just turning to where we get to on section 230, um, 231, sorry. This was interference or constraint. It was a plan put into place by the union which created at its lowest level an expectation of its members that they would vote at a particular time, in a particular way, at a particular place. We move on then to section 232. So the interference in subsection 1 is the system that required them to vote then and there in a particular <coughs> way, rather than the Pope... Uh, avoiding a, a fully postal ballot. The interference, well, it, yes. it, it, it is, let yes. me put it this way, it is interference yes. with the intended regime of fully postal ballot. The form that the interference takes is to create a continuum which begins with members intercepting ballot papers and receiving them in the workplace rather than at home. I, I, I just want to understand in relation to subsection 1 what you say the interference is in, re, in subsection 1. Yes, the interference, there, there is a significant overlap between, right. because what we say 
the, the breach of section 232 also amounts to interference. So we, these aren't. I'm, I'm only asking you because Lord Hendy said that the judge wrongly elided the two, um, and that the interference in subsection one is uh, uh, the judge wrongly treated as what occurred in breach of subsection two. My analysis of the judgment is as follows that the judge did, to some extent, consider sections 231 and 232 alongside each other. But he made a finding that, and looking at it in reverse, he made a finding that there was a breach of section 232 as evidenced by the interception. That is part of a continuum which we say taken together amounts to interference. Uh, and we add into the continuum a, a component that the judge didn't add in, which was the vote immediately component. Because uh, if, if you're being told by your union that you should vote immediately, that is a constraint on you using whatever period of the three weeks that the ballot was open for that you wish to use for the purpose of deciding how you want to vote. So we take the continuum the plan, whether it's a requirement, instruction, exhortation, encouragement, doesn't really matter, um, but we take all of that as amounting to interference um, in the entitlement to vote, and sorry, in being allowed to vote. And we say being allowed to vote comprises the end-to-end -end process. So being allowed to vote is not simply the moment at which you put your cross on the ballot, because that is, in, in, literal, in a literal sense, that is the point at which you vote. But being allowed to vote in the context of the legislative scheme is being allowed to vote outside your workplace and on a fully postal basis. Um, so that's section 231. Section 232, um, we say that this is the most <coughs> obvious and clearest of the three breaches that we say the trade union was guilty of. So far as reasonably practical person entitled to vote must, must have a voting paper sent to him by post at his home address. The balance of the section doesn't arise because there's no suggestion that there had been any request to treat the workplace as the uh, place of voting. Sent to him by post at his home address. We say implicit in that process is that the parliamentary intention is that it is received at home. And it is a false distinction to make to suggest that the union is entitled to proceed on the basis that all it has to do is put the letters in the post, but is thereafter entitled to instruct. Um, and I say that Mr. Lord Hendy's submission takes you this far, because if he's right, it must be the case that the union is, is entitled to instruct. Uh, and yet it's still at the same time, say, as far as reasonably practicable, uh, the paper has been sent to him by post uh, at his home address. Could the union have said, um, we're very keen to get as many votes as we can, uh, many people, not just many votes in favour, we want as full a response as we can, we want to know where our members stand on this important industrial action. Uh, you may consider that um, it might be helpful if you took the ballot paper from the frame, uh, and that will ensure that you don't take it home and lose it or forget it. Uh, and that will maximise the opportunity that we will get as many votes as we can. Um, I think the difficulty with going down this route of analysing what falls the right or wrong side of the line is that, that it would there are an infinite number of factual well, nuances. I do see that. I suppose what I'm trying to test is whether it can be right to say that uh, any, um, any observation from the Union or any comment or statement from the Union which might um, encourage or suggest to somebody that they remove the ballot from the frame is inherently unlawful because they have to say 
can I can I take it? Can I can I take it this far? It is it is likely to be inherently unlawful because if the parliamentary intention is that there should be a fully postal ballot, and if by that one understands that a fully postal ballot is the paper is received at home so that he can consider it at home away from the workplace. If the union does something which is designed to frustrate that purpose, whether it's put at the level of instruction or encouragement or suggestion, that is likely to result in Section 232 being breached. It may or may not also involve a finding of improper interference. But if the, if the statutory purpose is, as I say it is, which is you should receive your paper at home so that you can consider it away from yes. the pressures well, that are in I the workplace. What I wonder is whether, what makes it rather difficult is a totally unusual factual situation here. Agreed. And if somebody takes from the fray, I wonder whether that's not really the equivalent of having it delivered at home. Um, it is now, it's their choice to take possession of it here and now um, rather than take possession of it at home. It just ah, seems well, slightly I, artificial. To well, say. I, I think I can deal with it in this way, that if a trade union member decided off his own bat, without any encouragement from the union, simply to remove the paper from home and, and go through the protocol that the Royal Mail provides, although I don't think the protocol is essential to the argument, if he did that, then it wouldn't be possible for me to say uh, sensibly, that as far as reasonably practicable, the union hadn't organised the ballot with voting papers being sent to him at his home address. But the analysis that I would commend to you is the analysis that Mr Justice Swift uh, adopted, which is the interception of ballot papers at the behest of the union, bringing the voting process back into the workplace, is contrary to the process that Parliament had in mind when it amended the statute in 1993. But as, as to whether it is possible that there is some form of um, encouragement or advice that the union might be able to give, well, I'm, I'm reluctant to try and identify circumstances which I say fall the right side of the line. I need go no further. I submit for the purposes of this appeal in saying what the union did in this case plainly falls the wrong side of the line. And that is, of course, a point at which one, one can have regard, again, to subsections 2A and 2B, because um, one can see in those sections where Parliament has said, well, yes, we're, we're hap we, can, we can understand that there is a need for ballot papers to be received within the workplace. We can't do anything sensible about that, because to do so would mean that um, merchant seamen could never go on strike. <laughs> They'd never be able to organise a ballot that... Uh, because the problem is that the, the, the period of the ballot would be years, because until you got all members back in their home address and able to vote, you'd have a, a balloting period that went on for months and months and months. So this recognises the reality that we cannot achieve a situation in which this is fully postal voting. To the extent that we can, we do it by putting on the union not an absolute obligation, it's as far as reasonably practicable, and the reasonable practicability prevents, for example, the individual uh, from removing ballot paper from, in, from his own frame or the individual bringing it into work and say, going into the canteen and asking his mates what he thinks he should vote. Um, but the, it, the obligation is on the union, uh, not on the individual. And, Lord, of course, one reads this legislation as how it's intended to apply to the generality rather than the specific. So we have a particularly unusual factual circumstance um, in which I would suggest that uh, had Parliament been given uh, the uh, suggestion that within Royal Mail the union could direct or suggest to members that they produce a de facto workplace ballot, Perhaps Parliament would have legislated for that particular circumstance as well as for the particular circumstance of merchant seamen. But it would be a slightly unusual piece of legislation that regarded itself as needing to be quite so specific uh, in circumstances where the words of the statute are perfectly clear, the underlying parliamentary intention is perfectly clear. It's to take 
the balloting process away from the pressures that prevail within the workplace. Take it away from the frenzy that Mr. Webb was anxious should be created uh, amongst the members in the workplace by getting the votes to take place there. And one final point on section 232 is this. Um, question came up about the independent scrutineer earlier on um, and Lord Hendy said, well, the scrutineer gave it a clean bill of health. Well, of course, the clean bill of health given by the scrutineer is on the day that the ballot closes, so the 15th of October. We became alive to these deficiencies towards the end of October. Well, the clean bill of health simply said we haven't had any complaints. That's pretty much No, what well, you, actually, you, you weren't actually... Mr. Lord Hendy didn't actually take you to the report. I know he, he took you to the email, but the email's not the report. Uh, the report is in... Um, the exhibits to uh, Mr. Macaulay's statement. Uh, at page 47, or 46 and 47. That's behind tab three, is it? Yes, behind tab three. Well, it, it, it is 47. So that, that gets, that gets um, delivered the same day that the ballot closes on the 15th of October. One sees that the ballot closes at noon. I don't think 46 can be. 47. 47. Sorry. Sorry. Apologies. 40, 46 is the result. 47 is the scrutineer's report. My fault. But it's, it's helpful to have that report open. Um, we've written to the independent scrutineer once we got the judgment of Mr Justice Swift on Monday. We've written to the scrutineer raising these issues uh, with them, but um, we haven't had a reply yet. But page 47 is, is um, helpful because if one looks at paragraph B, one can see that one of the matters that the scrutineer reports on is that the arrangement made with respect to the production, storage and distribution and return of the voting papers um, was such as were reasonably practical for the purpose of minimising the risk of any unfairness or malpractice. And of course, the <coughs> union gets a clean bill of health in circumstances in which there's no evidence or suggestion by the union that they had cleared this plan with the scrutineer before implementing it. Um, because uh, if one looks at um, the code of practice on industrial action ballots, sorry, where's that? Tab two. One point that um, deals with the paragraph B of the report at 47 and then one other paragraph which is relevant to the broader point that I've made uh, on opportunity to vote. Um, so paragraph 39 of the Code of Practice, the Union wish to ensure that arrangements, this is page 14, tab 2, the authorities, the Union will wish to ensure that arrangements for producing and distributing bit voting papers will prevent mistakes which might invalidate the ballot. If in doubt, the independent scrutineer may provide useful advice. So it was open to the trade union to say to the um, scrutineer, this is what we're planning to do. We're planning to say to the members, get your papers, vote immediately, line up and post those votes. Um, I might have been in a little bit more difficulty if there was evidence that that had been put to the scrutineer and the scrutineer had sanctioned it there is no such evidence. The other paragraph that I wanted to take you to within the Code of Practice is paragraph 31 and 30, paragraphs 31 and 32. Paragraph 31, vote, voting papers must be sent out by post and members must be enabled conveniently to, to return them by post at no expense to themselves. In practice, this means 
prepaid reply envelope. Then at 32, we have this. The period between sending out voting papers, i.e. the opening day of the ballot, and the day by which completed papers should be returned, should be long enough for voting papers to be distributed and returned, and for the member concerned to consider their vote. The plan that the union put in place cut right across that. So you have a ballot that's on the face of it open for three weeks, but you have a union-sanctioned method of voting, which means that substantial numbers of votes are not done at home when the member concerned has a chance to consider it. It's done immediately in the workplace. Form a queue. So, the, the, in effect, the balloting window on the union's exhortation is not simply, can you vote early? It is, do it in this way, do it immediately. And instead of a three-week ballot, you have a three-hour ballot. <coughs> or a three-day ballot, if you... Take, the, take account of the fact that balloting papers will, might arrive in the delivery offices on the 25th, 26th or 27th. Uh, and we say that was not a convenient opportunity to vote by post within section 232B. And, uh, risk of repeating myself, it, it, it's not simply encouragement to vote early. It's do it in this particular way, at this particular time, with your colleagues. All of that falls way short, we say, of providing a convenient opportunity to vote. It cuts right across a ballot that's been notionally open for three weeks, but which the union wants done and dusted from a voting point of view, within hours or days of the ballot papers being issued by the scrutineer. Uh, can I then <laughs> finally deal with a couple of points on section 232. Um, Lord Hendy suggested that the effect of the judgment was that postal was the only method by which voting was allowed. And with respect, that was neither my submission nor the judge's finding. Because if one looks at paragraph 33 of the judgment, the judge recognised that voting at work was not prohibited And I've said repeatedly that we don't suggest that the statutory framework prevents an individual or individuals deciding that's what they want to do. Our criticism is of the ballot that was organised by the union and the way in which it was organised. Section 234, i deal with that very briefly. Um, what we say the judge did was take a realistic view of the evidence as demonstrated by the Swansea video. That was a modern day example of the car park ballot process. Individuals congregate in the canteen, many with their ballot papers, get them in the post is what the union rep says at the end of that exercise. It is quite plainly, on any realistic view of the, ex of the evidence, a union-orchestrated communal mass vote. As I said a few moments ago in relation to Section 234, no evidence from the union of any steps taken to prevent that. And in fact, by reference to my annex to my skeleton, uh, it's... It's, um, it goes beyond Swansea on a, on a sensible view of the evidence. The role that De Minimis has to play in this, we say, is, is a limited one. Because when one looks at the provisions of Section 234, the 
the requirement is that the ballot be conducted so far as reasonably practicable to secure that those voting do in secret. That was either done or it wasn't done. And we say the Swansea evidence demonstrates that it wasn't done, either in isolation or in conjunction with the items identified in the annex to my skeleton argument. I think so, so are you saying that there's no room for the de minimis principle in subsection 4 um, as a matter of principle? Yes, that's my first submission. My second submission is, um, even if I'm wrong about that, that the judge was right to conclude that this is uh, not de minimis, this is a flagrant exercise of orchestration and if I'm wrong about that then I say look at the other evidence which points to um, open balloting going on so for example the South Midlands videos which you'll see are bookended uh, by the appearance of union representatives and sandwiched in between them are people either holding their ballot papers with the vote on it in some cases it's sealed in some cases it's it's actual voting taking place. Nothing has been done by the trade union to prevent the frenzy from spilling over into an exercise of open and collective voting rather than individual voting away from the workplace. Um, very briefly, the cross notice, I've touched on some of these points already as, as alternative bases upon which to um, uh, uphold the decision. We, we um, were unable to find favour in front of the judge, in the judge below, on the questions of I immediate voting and mass voting. So was the union's instruction, <laughs> I keep using that word, it's, it's a default word I'm afraid, was the union's plan that members should vote immediately and then queue up outside uh, in mass voting exercises, did that involve a breach of section 230? Dealing firstly with the vote immediately point, uh, I've touched on that in the context of uh, section 231 already. I also rely on it in relation to section 232b that by confining members to vote immediately, you are not, um, as far as reasonably practicable, giving them a convenient opportunity to vote because you are closing the window for voting on a de facto basis for all those individuals who take the ballot papers out of the frame. But if the union had said, um, what we want you to do is bring your ballot papers in as soon as you receive them at home, um, and vote here so that they don't bring them in straight away so, and vote so that they don't get lost. We're worried about the dog eating the ballot paper or what have you. Well, there couldn't have been any. There couldn't have been any complaint about the. We want you to bring it straight in and vote now. Could there? Well, if you're saying if you're saying to the member if you're sending members a ballot, ballot paper that says you've got three weeks to vote, and then you're saying to them, well, actually, you haven't got three weeks to vote. We want you to bring it in now and vote immediately. Then you well, are cutting like across the period of the ballot. What we'd like you to do. It's well, like... yes, well, then, then we're into that semantic debate about... Uh, it's a, it, it, we can take it from, uh, hopefully not in a way that is too offensive to um, Lord Hendy's clients, but sometimes one is made an offer that one can't refuse. Uh, and if, if the union saying to you what we'd like you to do, my teacher may say to my child, I'd like this is what I'd like you to do for your homework. It's not simply a... Uh, a suggestion. It's an indication of expected behaviour. Um, and it would be quite difficult for the union to frame that uh, in a way which um, uh, that doesn't potentially uh, give rise to taking away a convenient opportunity. Because the moment the member feels under pressure, well, I know I've got three weeks, but the union really wants me to do this, uh, there is a risk that they will be denied a convenient opportunity to vote. There is a risk of interference. I don't wish to, as it were, get drawn in as any, any more than I'm forced to on these hypothetical examples, because, again, I come back to my primary point, it, it, which is 
whatever may be plausible or acceptable as something which falls the right side of Section 230, this was not that case. In a way, you're, you're relying upon a number of factors coming together. Yes, we, we put it in terms of a continuum, a, a, a continuum that begins with retreat interception uh, and ends with lining up to vote. And that's why we also suggest that the lining up to vote does involve interference, because when you're lining up to vote, you're not simply doing it, as it were, um, uh, at, at the union's suggestion. It's, it's part of a series of um, uh, guidelines, instructions, exhortations, whatever language one wants to use. It's, it's part of a series of expectations in your behaviour which the union has created. And in fact, of course, the continuum begins before the first stage at which they're implemented. The continuum is most clearly demonstrated at the gate meeting, Stockton gate meeting. And well, you've, got your, you've got your continuum point, which I, yes. think, uh, I think I understand. But uh, I mean, whether encouragement to vote early or to bring the ballot papers in to take part in a mass posting that could be filmed would be independent breaches of Section 230, i.e. without the interception of the frame, uh, yes, but doesn't, I, I don't, doesn't I don't, really arise, does I, it? I, I don't really need to, to go that far because I can rely on my continuum point. And that what I say is that the judge uh, was wrong to discount from the continuum because what, what we say he should have done is treat the process as an end-to-end -end one um, uh, it, which began with the gate meeting and ended with the individuals lining up to go through the turnstiles as an indication that they had voted uh, and voted yes. Um, and that is not far short of the car park balloting process because it is indicating to your colleagues in pretty clear terms, unless you were going through the voting process with your hands behind your back and your fingers crossed, it's, it's indicating to the world that you've done everything that the union has directed you to do. Uh, and we say that that, that continuum uh, does involve uh, a, a, a breach of section 230, subsection 1, and the vanishing window of opportunity for voting uh, does represent a breach of section 232 b Yes. Well, I understand, that I thought the judge below, I'd have to go back and look at it, but I thought as far as this was concerned, he was treating it as though it were a separate argument in its own right. In other words, even if everything else is okay, putting them all together, standing up, voting together, that's unlawful. And I think he was saying, well, that wouldn't be unlawful. And I'm not sure you're disagreeing with that. You're saying as part of a continuum, it becomes part of the whole unlawful activity. Yes, I think the, con the concern was that the, the judge was, as it were, discounting elements of the process when, when uh, our argument, I mean, we can win on the individual points that we won on, but we should also have won uh, on the basis that one treats this as an exercise and one can't fill it out little bits of it and say, well, that bit's fine because that bit doesn't take place in isolation. It takes place alongside a number of other events which, when put together uh, collectively, some of them individually, of course, the interception of the ballot, um, but the, the, the ends of the continuum, we say, uh, properly amount to interference for purposes of Section 230. Yes. Uh, unless anything else, my Lord, those, those are my submissions. Right. Thank you very much. Lord Henry? Uh, a, a series of uh, relatively short points. First of all, in Mr. Carr refers to uh, the CWU plan, and that's, that's the repeated word which appears to derive from w Mr. Uh, Webb's posting, which your Lordships had, supplementary bundle divider, three page 52. Just to point out to your Lordships, and I'm not going to take your Lordships there, but Mr. Webb explained what his plan was in a witness statement, and that is to be found in supplementary volume, Divider 1, page 40, sorry, page 117 at 
page 118. And it's a plan, as one would expect, of communications, because he's the communications officer. Lord, Mr Carr said at one point that anybody who didn't do what the union uh, wanted them or wished them to do would be questioned about that and would be under enormous pressure. And I think my Lord, Lord Justice Mayles said somebody who didn't do what was asked would stand out. My Lord, with respect, there, there is no... I said that was his point, in fact. Sorry? I said that was his point. That was his point, indeed. Uh, but there is no evidence to support it. There's no evidence to support anybody being under pressure, let alone enormous pressure, or being identified. And in the video at Swansea, we know that there were 32 people present out of several hundred who worked at that site. Nobody knows what marks were put on the ballot papers except for those who cared to show them. Except, of course, that lots of people were shouting vote yes. But that's a different thing altogether. So, with, in our respectful submission, your Lordship should not consider that there was any pressure put on anybody in the absence of evidence. And well, the next point I wanted to deal with was this question of encouragement and instruction, or the continuum that Mr Carr puts before your Lordships. We make the point that encouragement by the CWU to its members to do something which is lawful simply cannot be the basis of an objection. And amongst the things that are lawful is encouragement to vote, encouragement to vote yes, encouragement to vote early, and encouragement to post completed sealed ballot envelopes back together with other postal workers. Well, Lord, it, just in relation uh, to a posting event, it, it, it simply couldn't be the case that a posting event by itself, your Lordships understand what I mean by a posting event shorthand, it could be uh, regarded as, as unlawful. And just as if in my street I organised as many people with postal votes has wanted to exercise them to post them all together in a single post box and filmed it, that would not in any way invalidate the general election in our submission, uh, nor could this. Now, Lord, that doesn't answer the question of taking the members' own envelopes from the frame, the encouragement to vote then and there, which implies doing it at the workplace. And that encouragement, which, as the judge found, created the opportunity for non-secret voting. Those are the challenged issues which ha have to be dealt with. Now, my lords, in relation to that, can I just draw attention to the learned judge's findings on those points in paragraph 32 of his judgment, which is at page uh, 72 of the core bundle. And in paragraph 31, he identifies three submissions from Mr. Carr. A is that the encouragement to vote early or even immediately amounted to interference. B that organising the mass posting events also comprised interference. And he answers those two points by saying in paragraph 32, as to arguments A and B, I don't consider these matters on the evidence available disclosed breaches of obligations arising under section 230 to the standard required by section 221. I don't consider that either encouragement to vote early or organising or encouraging mass posting events can be considered to be any form of improper interference. And 
we respectfully at submit that the learned judge was right in that conclusion. At paragraph 33 over the page, he says four lines down, notwithstanding that the CWU told its members to vote at work, I accept that in principle there's a distinction between that statement and a breach of the obligation relating to secret voting. Voting at work is not necessarily voting in public. And then a Four lines from the bottom of that paragraph, he says the, there's evidence in form of pictures and video so that show CWU members at work displaying completed voting papers and on the video saying how they'd voted. But so far as I see it, that evidence may be no more than examples of enthusiastic CWU members who chose to publicise their votes. The obligation at 234 does not prohibit this sort of enthusiasm. And that... Uh, uh, sentiment is repeated in the next paragraph. If your lordships go six lines down, the line begins to secure so far as is reasonably practical that voting is in secret. And his lordship says, if voters want to fill in their voting papers in public, that amounts to no breach by the union of its obligation under section 234. But the Swansea Delivery Office videos are at some remove from that scenario the practical effect of the CWU's encouragement for members to remove their voting papers from the frames and vote there and then provided the circumstances where a breach of section 234 <coughs> could uh, occur. And uh, the next uh, sentence but one, Swansea video evidence, one occasion when risk the CWU ran by encouraging workplace voting was uh, realised. And he said, and then at the end he says, don't accept this at de minimis. So the, the issue that I have to address is the circumstances where the CWU created the opportunity for non-secret uh, of, of voting, which I'll come to in, in just one uh, moment. Well, Mr Carr says that the absence of any complaint from any member is not at evidence that there were uh, no uh, grievances, even though they might not be expressed. But the fact of the matter is that the evidence goes further than that, because there is no even anonymous complaint which could have been made to the employer or to the scrutineer, even if a member didn't wish to complain to the uh, union. There is no complaint of any kind, no hint of a complaint. Nobody appears to have said anything to anybody that's been reported to the employer or to the scrutineer to raise any issue of grievance on the part of any member at all. In our submissions, that is significant <coughs> in a workforce of 110,000 uh, work workers. Lord, Mr Carr took your lordships to a evidence uh, at various pages on the 20 of events occurring on the 25th of September 2019 and he made the point that that was the date on which the bulk of the balloting letters would have been delivered to the sorting offices uh, to go to the members which of course we uh, accept. There may have been some left over that were delivered to the sorting offices on the 26th of, of September. The only relevance of it in uh, this part of my submission is that it means that the films that were taken had no impact on the bulk of the membership because they had already voted. These films were taken in, in the morning and obviously they, they're unlikely to, perhaps they were viewed at lunch lunchtime, that's conceivable, or the afternoon on the way home from uh, work, but those people had voted al already. The impact that it might have had on members who had not yet voted could only have been on those who viewed it on the day of the 25th, after the films were uh, made, and before they voted, but before they'd obtained their ballot papers on the 26th. So we are talking not of the hundreds of or tens of thousands uh, uh, that uh, might otherwise be implied. Lord, 
the statutory purpose of section 230 was said by Mr Carr to be that the ballot papers should be received at uh, home. And my lords, I've made, made my submissions about that. We fundamentally disagree with that proposition. The purpose of section 230 is to ensure that the ballot papers are received by the members. Now the mechanism for doing so is to use the post. But the purpose is to ensure that the members receive the ballot paper and that they should v exercise their right to vote free from any interference or constraint in whether they voted or in what way they might have uh, voted. Now if the CWU had urged members to take their envelopes from the frames and destroy them, that would have been quite different. That really would have been an interference with the process. But to urge them to take their own letters from their own frames, letters addressed personally uh, to them, in our submission, is precisely fulfilment of the underlying purpose of Section 230. Lords, Mr Carr said that we have not demonstrated any steps taken by the union to procure uh, secret uh, voting. That's true. We haven't... He's right that no uh, CWU official said, by the way, vote in secret. But the reason for that is obvious. Everybody understood that the obligation is to conduct a secret ballot. And the evidence that demonstrates that is the size of, of this particular ballot. Because so far as is known, 99.976% of the electorate voted secretly. The only people that didn't vote secretly, so far as is known, are those who were filmed at, at Cardiff. <coughs> tiny, tiny proportion. So it wasn't necessary to tell everybody to vote secretly. Everybody knew that that was the, uh, what the requirement was. But as his lordship below pointed out, uh, enthusiasm clearly overtook a tiny, tiny number of uh, members. Lord, my learned friend, uh, men uh, referred to the, the British Airways case and Lady Justice Smith's uh, comments and, your Lord, and drew attention to the passage in which she says that the purpose is to conduct a fair, open and democratic ballot but points out that if those policies were breached it might be uh, that, that would uh, amount to a, a, a violation. But we make the point that nobody could say that this was not a fair, open and democratic ballot. Even given the irregularities to which Mr Carr points to, this was fair, it was open and it was democratic and it was overwhelming. Mr Carr says that the union should have taken legal advice as to whether or not it should have uh, uh, encouraged members to take their letters from the uh, frames. I, I make the rather rhetorical point that that rather begs the question as to what legal advice the union would have uh, received. It, may well, it doesn't really matter whether they took legal indeed. advice or not, does it? It doesn't, the Lord. So I move on. Lord, um, the... Mr Carr refers to the uh, green paper and in our submission that points to the level, the kind of interference which Parliament had in mind. And I remind your Lordships again of the words that are used in the green paper. Intimidation, misrepresentation, fraud or ballots not fairly and accurately counted. That's what this legislation was aimed at and none of that is present in this uh, case. And when in the Han excerpts, excerpts from Hansard, Lord Ulsworth Water talks about voting away from the pressures of the workplace, those are the pressures which Parliament 
had in uh, had in mind. The underlying purpose is to make sure that the democratic right of members to vote uh, was uh, is honoured, and that's in paragraph 3.7 of the Green Paper, which I don't uh, read again. But Lord, Mr. Carr's submissions proceed on the assumption that Parliament in making the amendment in 1993, did not wish the workplace to figure in the in balloting henceforth. But in our respectful submission, he overlooks the provision of section 232A. The Lordships have seen this many times, but 2A says... That so far as is reasonably practical, every person who is entitled to vote in the ballot must have a voting paper sent to him by post at his home or any other address which he's requested the trade union in writing to treat as his postal address. Now that means that the membership could, if they had wished to do so, indicate that they wanted their ballot papers sent to them at their workplaces. And that would be true in any industrial action ballot. So it can't be deduced from those words that, that Parliament intended only that through the postal balloting system, ballots would only be received at home with the exception of merchant seamen. It was open to members to receive their ballots at work if that's what they wish to do so. Except, of course, that's not the, what they, uh, the request that members made in, in this case. But it, that's not the issue. The issue is, what was the parliamentary intention? And the parliamentary <coughs> intention, it, it does not follow, was to bar uh, ballot papers being received at work. And if they were received at work then they could be filled in at work as well. Lord, um, I'm near the end, the, the, the next issue was the POA case. There, I do have something to say about that. Lord, it, the POA case is tab six in the bundle of authorities. <clears throat> Lord, five complaints were made in that case. I draw attention to paragraph 2.16, which your lordships have at page 19. Mr. Carr read paragraph 2.17, but just looking at 2.16, which he touched on but didn't read, it says, My predecessor held in Paul and Nalgo that the phrase without interference or constraint imposed by related to intimidation or other physical interference with the voter. I myself have followed this approach in subsequent cases. And then Mr. Carr read the first part of 2.17. There was an inherent interference or imposing of, of the constraint. But he didn't read to your lordships the last sentence, which says... Uh, this involved compromise because ballot papers before and after completion fell into the hands of officers of the union. This involved physical interference with the balloting process as well as imposing a constraint on voters by taking control over access to the ballot papers away from the scrutiny. And that's developed in the next paragraph. Purposes of the Act, the officials in Northern Ireland count as a union. No doubt their actions were not authorised. This doesn't help the union. In these circumstances, I find that in respect of the prisons, there was interference with and constraint imposed by the union. It was not possible to vote except in accordance with the procedure adopted by the local officials. This was constraint exercised through officials and was manifested by their having control over not only who received the ballot papers and what happened to the ballot papers, which were unused, but by controlling access to the papers generally. In view of the findings I make later, in respect of complaint five, such interference gave rise to the possibility of malpractice in respect of the election by creating the opportunity for others 
to have access to blank ballot papers which they would not and should not otherwise have had access to. And what the certification officer found was ballot rigging, unequivocal ballot rigging. And your lordships can see that in uh, paragraph uh, 2 to Oh, sorry, before I, I come to the complaint number five, just pick up one point that Mr. Carr made in uh, passing, and that is in relation to the arguments about returning the ballot papers by post. And what the certification officer found was that the union argument, which is set out in paragraph 2.28, that members must be given the chance to return the ballot papers by post, was not something that was fulfilled by the statutory provision, and that's uh, the rationale for that, is at 2.29, which I needn't read uh, further. Now, if your lordships go to page 31, your lordships see election complaint number five, and that is uh, set out there, I, I won't uh, read that paragraph, but over the page at 2.5, uh, five, uh, we see the basis of the ba finding of ballot rigging. If your lordships look uh, six lines down, there's a line beginning allocate, and the sentence picking up at the end of that reads, when ballot papers received their scanned on computers, it was noticed that 20 papers were rejected at the scanning process because the X had been placed outside the box. On examination, there was some similarity in the pens used to complete the ballot papers and the style of the X. Ballot papers from the same branch which had been processed were then extracted, and the similarity in completion was consistent throughout the returns. In oral evidence, the scrutineer said that the 20 rejected ones were from two branches. Form and size of many of the crosses were strikingly similar and involved a distinctive blue... Uh, ink, and then your lordships go to 2.66, which is at page 36. This complaint is simple and straightforward in its substance. Many of the ballot papers sent to the prisons were completed and returned by a few individuals to whom the papers were not addressed. In other words, the ballot was rigged. And 2.68. Uh, dealing with why he came to that conclusion, he says the three sets of characteristics identified corresponded exactly with the three sets, one of which I split further, I had identified. I gave up looking when I reached over 70 suspicious papers. The winner's margin was 78 votes. Subsequently, I looked at all of the papers for Northern Ireland and concluded the number of dubious papers, all of which were for one candidate were more than double the margin between the successful and unsuccessful candidate. So, my lord, that gives your lordship the background as to the sort of interference and constraint which will be and should be regarded as completely unacceptable and in breach of the statute or the equivalent uh, uh, statute. Lord. Well, in relation to the scrutineer's uh, report, I'm grateful to Mr. Carr for picking up my omission. The scrutineer's report on the 15th of October is in supplementary divider 3 at page 47. But just with that, your lordship should also see the email to which I drew attention this morning, which is supplementary divider 1, page 11. And the date of it is the 11th of November uh, 2019. So after these proceedings had been issued, of course I don't uh, imagine for a moment the scrutineer knew what the content of the proceedings uh, was. But that was a month and a half after the close of the ballot and still no uh, notice of any irregularity had come to his uh, uh, attention. Lord, and then I think that probably the, the final uh, or penultimate point that I need to make is that Mr. Carr says a realistic view of what happened at Swansea is that it was a modern-day car park ballot. Lord, it wasn't. A car park ballot, as described in the Green Paper, is with people who have 
not been necessarily properly identified as the proper balloting constituency, showing hands, and that show of hands being counted by somebody who is presumably from the uh, union standing in fr front of them. That is not necessarily an accurate count. The constituency may be inaccurate. What happened at Swansea is completely different. These were members who were entitled to fill in the ballot papers in front of them. The only irregularity that could conceivably be alleged against them is that they were, in doing it on the table, they could be seen to be voting by somebody else and therefore it was not necessarily uh, secret uh, voting. Lord, um, Mr Carr's uh, cross notice, I think that his arguments uh, were developed in the course of his main submissions and have probably been answered by me in the course of my reply. Yes. So unless I can assist your Lordships further. All right, well, despite the lateness of the hour, what we are going to do is rise now for a few minutes just to uh, see where we are. Ladies and gentlemen, um, to the resume your seats, please. Sorry, do you want to resume your seats? They're just coming.
Next, please. understand that uh, there is a degree of urgency uh, in having a decision uh, in this case and that both parties need to know as soon as possible what our decision is. Uh, we have decided that the appeal must be dismissed. Uh, we will put our full reasons in writing and hand them down uh, as soon as possible, we hope within the next few days. Uh, in the briefest outline, uh, however, what we have decided is that uh, the conduct uh, of the union, the course which it took, uh, had the effect uh, of amounting to interference with the process required by Section 230. Uh, we accept that the union did not intend to do anything uh, unlawful, but this is complex legislation uh, and this was an unusual situation. Uh, our view is that, looking at matters objectively, uh, what the union did uh, amounted to acting contrary to the statutory requirements. Uh, as I say, we will put all uh, that more fully uh, in writing. Uh, there will be no need for any attendance at, at the hand down. The judgment will uh, obviously be published on Bailey and so forth uh, as soon as it's handed down. If the parties are uh, unable to agree uh, any consequential matters, uh, we will deal with those by short written submissions. Uh, we are uh, very grateful for the excellent submissions that we've received from both Council.